it's great to have our guest uh, Jonathan Kurt right on. Uh, and Jonathan, uh, welcome. Uh, let's do a real brief bio, and then I want to get into the program. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, you are the CEO of MU Healthcare. Is that correct? Indeed. And that's a lot of hats, which we'll get into. (laughs) We could go into your background. I know you spent some time uh, in Minnesota at the Mayos and somewhere else, but let's just jump right into it. You've been in the healthcare administration business for quite a while. So let's talk about uh, uh, one of the – there's a couple of biggies we want to get to. Uh, Certainly a lot of the campus projects going on, the buildings. But before we get started, COVID-19 – uh, it's been a two-year difficult, difficult time. So what's the current situation at the MU Healthcare? Where are you right now? And then we'll do follow-up questions. Well, uh, I'm going to weigh in on the uh, music discussion here real quickly. <laughs> and I, I, I'm with Bob on this deal, uh, wearing my cowboy boots and enjoying that uh, n- noticeably. So thank you for uh, making that comment about country music. Uh <laughs> Well, you you're exactly right. Uh, these are these are challenging times. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we right right now. It, it, it um, one of my one of my uh, uh, midlife crises is that I like to surf. Believe it or not, that's what I like to. Do. I, I I do that every summer and I go surfing. Where do you and, go? Uh, to the east coast of Florida. Uh, and when we do that, the surfs surfing waves come in sets of four. Uh, typically, and that's kind of what we're in right now. Uh, I think that we're they're having sets of waves of COVID. Uh, I you know, and we thought that it, this thing was going to um, end in the summer, and and our, vo- our our COVID volumes just dropped off precipitously, and then it came back with a vengeance with Omicron. Uh, and as much as uh, we probably don't want to admit it, I, I think that COVID is going to be with us for a while. Uh, and uh, as, as far as uh, this current set, if you will, the current wave that we're in, uh, we're uh, thank goodness we're on a little we're on a down down a slope of that of that curve. Uh, it, uh, probably about a month or a month and a half ago, uh, we had 139 patients uh, that either there were COVID patients at MU Healthcare, and that represented about uh, 30 to 35 percent of our total uh, patients hospitalized patients. Uh, since then, and, and, and in Boone County alone, uh, we had about 40 active COVID patients per 1,000 population here in Boone County, which was, a very, which was a by far the highest number it's ever been uh, with COVID. That number is now, uh, inpatient-wise, we're at uh, 47, uh, and we are uh, uh, less than six uh, active COVID patients per 1,000 population in Boone County. So we're definitely on a, a downswing. But we can't take our we can't take a, uh, take our eye off the ball. This is going to be a challenge. Social distancing, ensuring that we wear our mask when appropriate, uh, whenever possible, uh, and we need to be vigilant uh, with well, hopefully with getting vaccines whenever possible uh, here in our area. Sounds good. The uh, uh, the the talk is that over time the. Uh, COVID becomes not a pandemic, but an endemic. I'm not sure I quite understand that language, but it's almost like someone saying it it becomes a manageable situation like the flu or the common cold over time, particularly as variants get weaker and weaker. Is that a fair appraisal of what we're talking about? Yeah, going back to my waves analogy, uh, I think you can make the same argument uh, for influenza as well, is that there's waves of influenza as well. And and we do uh, we predict what the what the influenza strain is going to be, and then we build a vaccine on that uh, uh, for several months in a, in a row. And uh, I, I I think, and I'm not a physician, but I do believe that that's going to be kind of the model that we have moving with forward. improved therapeutics along the way. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's right. So, numbers wise, we hear a lot about capacity in your industry, not just your your institution, but right. across the board. And what I find troubling about that, that discussion is the failure as a country to have properly and adequately dealt with that issue, um, the ability to deal with waves. Life, life isn't linear. Life, life is waves. And uh, what are we doing society-wise with regard to that? I mean, it's, it's, uh, there were, I read a lot of CDC reports uh, and uh, NIH reports regarding um, 
the serious infectious diseases regarding Ebola, Marburg, uh, that class, and the ability to, to be able to treat those in the country, which if people think the ability to treat for COVID is bad, wait till you get to the megas. Uh, there, there really is only about 34 beds in the entire country that are appropriately set. How, how are we dealing with that from a standpoint of edicts coming down from Washington about money and preparations for, for like we say, at the Grand Mall. Yeah. Well, if you were to talk to uh, nearly any um, hospital administrator or CEO in the United States, I serve on the Missouri Hospital yeah. Association board, uh, and I, I serve on several other national boards. And if you were to talk to anybody uh, right now and say, what is the number one issue facing uh, the healthcare system that's out there. It's so boring, but it's staffing. Uh, it's not beds. It's not capital. It's not bricks and mortar. It's not technology. It's ensuring that we have enough nurses, LPNs, uh, staff to work in the clinics. Uh, uh, right now, uh, it, you all know this, uh, but the great resignation is real. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, the, the quit rate uh, for the first time that, that I've seen is uh, it's over, over 3%. If you look at our vacancy rate at MU Healthcare, uh, we're uh, right around 12%. And, and our turnover rate has been uh, in the upper 20s for the last uh, 12 months. That has never happened uh, with us. Our, our turnover rate is typically pretty low. Uh, but it's a challenge. Staffing is a challenge. And so as far as uh, ways that we as a society – uh, can make major investments, uh, ensuring that we have the systems of care that we need. Uh, we need more nurses. We need more primary care physicians. Uh, and we need more staff that are going to help us take care of, of these uh, pandemics that are out there. Because this is not going to go away. And how we've got to have more staffing. How does the issue of pay weigh into this compensation? Yeah. Well, first off, if you look at the, uh, the compensation rate for frontline staff, nurses, LPNs, certified medical assistants, radiology techs, et cetera. Uh, the, average, uh, in, uh, the average compensation for those groups of people is up 10% from last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is up significantly. Uh, it, and, and with that, uh, we have had to uh, make uh, significant improvements on our compensation for our frontline staff. Uh, and we just... Uh, uh, have have made those changes in the last uh, 30 days. Uh, it's a challenge. Um, if, and, and the other thing that's out there is what we call agency staffing, uh, if you've heard of that, uh, of temporary nurses and staff that will come in. Um, oftentimes these nurses, we, we will have to pay 150 to $200 per hour for these nurses, and half of, at least half of which is going to the profits of, of the company. Uh, so we, 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 and we have to do it because we need more staff to take care of, of, our, of our patients. So compensation uh, is a real issue, uh, and it is a significantly um, a challenge uh, on our long-term financial viability as, as a, an industry, if you will. So okay, I've got to ask you another question, and uh, it has to do with organizi- organizing. You know, you go into these large medical centers, and everybody's unionized. And I remember the hospital I was born in in New Jersey, you know, it had strikes. You know, I mean, the union comes in, they organize the workers, and uh, you have to deal with that issue. Also, maybe the impact of signing bonuses. You employ those to try. I mean, you're advertising all the time. This has gone on for years, advertising, big display ads in newspapers, trying to find people to move here. And this is a very desirable working environment here as compared to some of these small towns that have these little hospitals that are basically just trying to survive. I've thrown a lot of things out there. They're not on the plate necessarily to talk about, but I think they're items that have to be considered. Well, we uh, absolutely work very hard every single day to ensure that we have a a wonderful culture, a wonderful working environment uh, at MU Healthcare, uh, and uh, we we are not a unionized uh, environment. Uh, and uh, we don't want to be a unionized environment because we want to be able to ensure that the frontline staff are getting a very solid compensation for a fair day's work 
and that their concerns and issues are being dealt with on a timely basis. And I think if you look at our culture and our performance uh, over time, we've done uh, this uh, fairly well. Uh, could we do better? We can always do better. But in general, I think that we have a very good culture uh, at MU Healthcare relative to taking care of and ensuring that the voice of our frontline staff is being heard. So how do we encourage uh, and, and I'll give you I'll give you a for example on that. My, uh, my brother is a night nurse at MU Healthcare, and he's my big brother. And it, it, I can assure you, if I do something stupid, uh, he's going to let me. He's going to let me have it. <laughs> Seems so how, fair. So, how do we encourage more people to go into this? Because I work with a lot of young people today. We have a physician assistant program at Stevens College that people don't talk about. I mean, how do we get people to work in these professions? They're very noble callings, and we need more of them. And I recognize that. Well, a couple of things. Uh, there are multiple, multiple accelerated nursing programs right here in central Missouri, and we partner with nearly every program that is out there. Uh, and uh, furthermore, we, uh, we as, a, as an organization, uh, we have our own train, train your own staff, if you will. If you're a, you graduate from Columbia Hickman and you, wanna, you don't want to go to uh, college, but you want to get started in, 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 a, in a healthcare or organization, uh, we will come and train you. We will pay you your salary, and we will do this in a way that is good for that uh, young man or woman uh, and, and in a way that puts them on a career path that's outstanding uh, for, for now and into the future. And so we work really hard at this, invest significant dollars in, in that area. And I greatly appreciate the fact that you uh, view this as a calling because I couldn't agree more. It is. And John- it's a blessing. Jonathan, uh, to leverage off what you talked about with the staffing challenges and all the oh adjustments that you've tried to make to yeah. deal with it, I think the uh, health care workers in general deserve a major shout-out for what they've done the last two years under sometimes terrible stress and difficulty. You want to talk? give me your take on that? Yeah. Well, thanks for asking that, uh, and you're exactly right. Um, if our team, uh, if you think about it, it, it I, I've said this to many people, but think about what the, if, what the morale of a country looks like whenever there's a war. There's the, at the beginning of the war, there's this huge, we're all in this together, we can do anything together as a team, and so the morale of the country goes way up. And then they start to realize that the war is not going to end anytime soon. And so the morale starts to drop and it drops precipitously and then it plateaus and then it gets into a new normal, if you will. Uh, we are we're now in year three, in a sense, of this topic. Uh, and, and people are are tired uh, every single day. They and if, if you think about it, every single day we're taking care of patients that have strokes and have heart attacks, and have traumas, uh, and have uh, cancer issues that are going on at the same time that we're taking care of, of patients with, with active COVID disease. Uh, and uh, so it, it's a challenge, um, but I'm here to tell you that um, our team works so hard. I'm so proud of them. I've never uh, worked in a more difficult time in my entire career uh, than 2020 through 2022, uh, but at the same time, I am so, so proud of the work that our team has done to keep Columbia, this county, and this region and the state uh, safe. And I do think that we've done a great job in that, re- in that regard. Yeah. Wanted to get you an opportunity to say that. That's because that's what I thought. Thank you. So well, is our model wrong? Is our model wrong? Meaning, you know, we've got a collective... Um, psyche with regard to how we deliver health care that is not just you guys you guys can only alter the fringe mm-hmm. uh I, you you've got a wonderful emergency capability in your facility unlike a lot of other hospitals that are high quality uh do we have a need in the country to have quote normal medical care mm-hmm. and outrageous medical care uh, we we do that with regard to accidents and things like that, but it's a nominal portion of the the total operational capability. Uh, is is a pandemic one that we in, should nationally be investing in greater um, the greater wave, if you will, and and put the regular healthcare in a different zone. Well. 
step back uh, a little bit and think about uh, the strengths of the University of Missouri and MU Healthcare. Historically, our number one department, the number one area where we've had some national prominence, believe it or not, is our Department of Family Medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we invest a lot of resources to ensure that we have the best primary care services uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, that is very, very different than nearly any academic medical center in the United States. So more and more and more, and this is where the model, and I appreciate your question about the model. Uh, what I think is going to happen if we get in our uh, time machine and go forward 10 years, 15 years in the future here in central Missouri, I think what's going to happen is, is that we are going to have outstanding primary care, urgent care, imaging, therapy services, places where we have access to telehealth, uh, the, out in the community surrounding Columbia so that we're pushing the knowledge that is in our subspecialist heads as much as possible into the community, uh, care close to home. The best example I've got of this is that when Pinnacle Hospital closed in Boonville uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we came in and said, look, we know that we, 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 this is not going to be a town with an inpatient hospital but it needs to have outstanding primary care services in that community. Uh, so we came in, and we're, if you go to Boonville right now, next to their Walmart, we're building a brand new, outstanding uh, primary care clinic. Uh, it's right around twelve to fifteen million dollars, uh, and we, I think, that we will have these sorts of models hither and yon throughout uh, Central Missouri more and more and more. Uh, in the future. So the model will not be a traditional hospital-based model. Thanks for asking. Question about, uh, before we finish with COVID, because I want to get into some of your projects like the Women's and Children's Hospital, et cetera, but uh, operational performance during the uh, pandemic had to suffer, and you probably observed deferred procedures that uh, uh, was really bad, were really bad news for some of the people that had to do that. You, can you address those two things quickly? Sure. Well, uh, MU Healthcare, if you look at our scorecard, if you will, of, of our performance over the last two years, uh, a, a couple of things that I think are important. Uh, our volumes have never been higher. Uh, uh, our, our non-COVID volumes have never been higher. Uh, our uh, quality and safety uh, ratings compared to any academic medical center in the United States uh, what we call the Vizient Quality and Accountability Study Rankings. We've been, we've been in the top quartile for two years in a row on that ranking, and that's compared to Duke and Mayo and Cleveland Clinic and uh, KU Med and, and UCLA, that sort, of th- that sort of crowd. Top quartile, two years in a row. It's our best performance in a two-year period we've ever had. Uh, and so that's our a, team that's is a doing well. Deal. It's a huge Congratulations. deal. Congratulations. It's a huge deal, and it requires – Thousands and thousands of people putting their shoulder to the wheel and saying that we're going to do this. Uh, uh, financially, uh, it's been a, uh, a tough year, a couple of years, uh, but we're, we're certainly uh, in a, a sustainable model. Uh, we certainly are achieving our, all of our budgeted numbers uh, of late and, and for last year and, and then this for this year. Uh, so our performance has done well. I will say, though, that this last round of this, of this wave, going to the first comment uh, 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 of, of the Omicron, when we had 139 inpatients, uh, it, it's, people always act like it's the patients coming in. Well, it's also our community. So it's, it's, it's our nurses that have a family member that ha- has COVID or a, a, a child care uh, worker that's taking care of a child. Uh, of one of our staff that gets COVID. And so we have had to significantly uh, decrease uh, a lot of our traditional inpatient uh, uh, surgical procedures. I, I don't like the term elective because elective is uh, denotes something that frankly is not there. Uh, but we, in the last uh, a month and a half, we've had to defer uh, approximately uh, 300 inpatient uh, surgical procedures. Uh, notice I didn't say cancel because we will get those patients taken care of over time. Uh, but uh, for the first for the first time since June of 2020, we had to actually defer some cases because of uh, the COVID challenges. That's Jonathan Curtright. We're up against a break. I'll make a couple of comments before we break and run some commercials. 
Uh, first of all, temperature is 45 degrees. Right now it's headed for a high around 60. The Boonville situation reminds me of a situation that existed in the past in Los Angeles where they had what were called receiving hospitals. Mm-hmm. So when Bobby Kennedy was shot in the kitchen at the Ambassador Hotel in 1968, he was taken first to what was called the receiving hospital, and then he went to a first-class institution in that city. But the other thing that I like in this COVID crisis, too, and I've read a great deal about World War II, this is like World War II. What happened two years ago was akin to me to Pearl Harbor, and I wasn't alive at the time. So maybe we're in 1943, where things are starting to turn around. We start winning some battles. Hitler is going to on the run. The Russians <laughs> have come in from the east, and they are trying to take care of Hitler. We are fighting Hirohito. We're working our way toward the uh, the home islands of Japan. Now, I'm not hoping for an atomic bomb type of solution to this thing, but we're kind of <laughs> in the midway point in the war against covid and uh, I hope due to your offices and a lot of offices of people that are involved in medical care in this country, and they're in the millions, and there's a lot of money. It's a very, very big deal. And the frontline responders to this thing, I think, deserve our thanks. Good morning. You're on the air. Go ahead. Good morning. My husband and I are, are, have <clears throat> appointments with doctors and are very pleased with our doctors at the university. However, parking is really kind of tight, and I've had to hoof it over from the orthopedic clinic uh, parking lot. And I'm an 85-year-old in good shape, but I might not be. And the thought of maybe getting in a golf cart or a minivan going from the orthopedic clinic to or the parking garage to the university is not an exciting thing for me. And I was wondering... Why was there not parking involved in the new next-gen building, and what plans do you have for parking? Okay. Question so noted. Yeah. The, the official uh, question that every CEO has to deal with is uh, food uh, and, and parking, uh, uh, and probably pay as well sometimes. Uh, it, it, parking will, it, it is a challenge. Uh, I'm not denying that at all. Um, many, but I'm here to tell you, though, in general – uh, our parking is pretty solid compared to most places that, that are especially in the in, inner city setting. I am sorry that you um, had to make that trek uh, for a block and a half. Uh, that's, a, that's a significant issue, and we are actively uh, coming up with new ways that we can ensure that our staff have parking, and, and, but most importantly that our, our patients and their visitors uh, have adequate on-site parking. So rest assured that uh, we are actively working on this. Uh, and, and in terms of, uh, of next gen, directly across the street is the uh, parking lot. There's a parking structure that we have there uh, that in general has a good solid access for our, our patients and for our staff. Isn't that parking garage the largest parking garage on campus? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I think I, it is. I it's like three thousand spaces. Yes. It's, it's I don't. Big. Know, I don't know the yeah. number, but it's a. Uh, it's pretty it's doggone big. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know what? I'd rather have this issue than the opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll take uh, uh, challenges with parking. That cause that means you've got a decent product that people want to uh, come come and get. So thank you for your for your comment and your question. We will do better. You know, something we never dive into, and it's not on the plate to talk about, and we'll get you back here another time to talk about, but I find the connection with VA to be very interesting. There's a tunnel connecting connecting the two facilities. We never talk about the Truman VA Hospital, and I think that is a significant part of the whole mosaic of health care in this region. Boy, couldn't couldn't agree more. Uh, It is a significant uh, part of the value uh, of of the healthcare system here in Columbia in terms of research, in terms of outstanding care to the veterans and their families. Uh, and uh, oftentimes it's from the who's faculty. The, who's the director? We need, we need to get the director in. We need to get your equivalent in on this program. And Bob arranges these interviews, <laughs> and so you need to talk to him about who is running VA and whether they would be uh, – willing or interested in coming in on Sunday morning. I don't right. think that's Jonathan's job, but you make a good suggestion. No, no. All right. Well, Bob, <laughs> David, you move on. It's, well, it's a good question, one. Question for you. I don't want to get out of here without talking about the uh, new Children's Hospital Project. I know you broke ground last, I think it was October, mm-hmm. uh, and I think it's about a two-and-a-half-year project mm-hmm. for its built, but moved from Keene Street down there. So tell us about it. It's a big deal, and maybe there are others. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to tie this in with COVID for just a second, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, COVID, not everything that came out of COVID has been bad. 
uh, COVID has forced us to think very, very differently about how we provide our operations. Getting back to David's comment about what the model needs to look like for the future. Uh, And our facility on Keene Street, the Women's and Children's Hospital, former Columbia Regional Hospital, has served us well for many, many years. But it was, it was a building that was never designed to be a 100-year building, uh, and it needed new skin, it needed new HVAC, and when you added up the total capital of what it was going to take to rehab that hospital, it was going to be over $50 million on a facility that, didn't, that wasn't predicted to be its normal shelf life. Um, So, and furthermore, the distance between Women's and Children's Hospital and the University Hospital campus is only three miles, but operationally, in many times, it might as well have been 300 miles. Uh, And so we had significant, significant duplicated services uh, between the University Hospital campus and Women's and Children's. That's the background. Uh, So... We uh, go back in time. We we uh, had deferred um, about thirty five percent of our total surgical cases. We were losing about thirty five percent of our total revenue, and we knew we had to dramatically change the model to be sustainable into the future, and provide the best possible care and leverage the faculty in the School of Medicine for adult and for ch- children's health. And they and there's ways that you can cross cover each other in that way. Um, so we decided we were going to embark on uh, consolidating and re-energizing and putting all of our inpatient traditional hospital cases, patients, uh, onto the university hospital campus. Uh, we have broken ground, and we are probably a year into a three-year project. Uh, there will be nine floors. Uh, there, uh, There's shelled space. Uh, it'll be predominantly uh, for uh, obstetrics, the neonatal intensive care unit, uh, and for pediatrics and their pediatric subspecialty care. It will open uh, in the summer of 2024, uh, and we are incredibly excited about this, and it's going to make it so that we are more efficient and providing even better care uh, because we're all going to be based on one campus. 200-plus million-dollar project. Yeah, thank thank you, curators uh, and President Choi and CFO Ryan Rapp. Uh, we, it's a two hundred and thirty two million dollar project, uh, and it's I believe it's one of the largest, if not the largest, project in the history of the University of Missouri. Uh, and uh, it's in, including it's on, including stadiums and arenas. Indeed, no, I don't know. And next gen, uh, as, yeah. as I recall. The original hospital, which was opened in 1956, I think was a $15 million project, yeah, <laughs> something yeah. like that. Yeah, the, we, 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 we certainly have expensive toys sometimes. David? Uh, Jonathan, I, on, on that hospital in particular, what kind of ICU is, uh, is envisioned for pediatrics? You talk neonatal, but general pediatrics. Well, within that footprint within that building. And first off, it's going to be attached on every floor of our patient care tower. And that's very intentional. So you can share resources. You can walk from building to building. Uh, So so we're going to have three different intensive care units in that facility. Uh, One will be, as I mentioned before, the neonatal intensive care unit. There will be 60 private uh, rooms uh, for uh, families and for young uh, infants that, that need incredibly complex care. Uh, and, and that's a difference from what we have right now. Oftentimes we'll have an open room where there'll be multiple uh, young infants uh, that are in one room. So we're going to have 60 uh, private rooms. Secondly, we're going to have a, a, a unit for our pediatric intensive care unit. Uh, and then also, and this is a, may, may seem a little odd, but on the ninth floor of that building, uh, we're going to be able to share resources, and we're going to be able to have a uh, neurosciences intensive care unit as well that will take care of of uh, children, but mainly adults. One other thing, the uh, when you complete this project, and it is a massively important one, uh, is MU Healthcare pretty much fully centralized in one campus? I don't think you have any satellites left, do you, <laughs> at the end? Yeah, well, it, 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 it's 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 very much of a strategy, right? Yeah. So, so our inpatient hospital services will be on the university hospital campus. 
there will be 42 be- there are 42 beds in the Missouri Orthopedic Institute uh, and then about that same amount uh, uh, in our uh, MU Psychiatric Center. But it, as a crow flies and uh, if somebody that's a good golfer, uh, they're pitching wedge away from each other. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's very purposeful. Uh, right. And we want to be, why, why do we want to do that? We want to be able to share resources with our emergency medicine, with imaging, with our uh, operating rooms, uh, with registration and scheduling. And so we can make it so that it's an, an incredibly efficient and uh, um, a, pr- a good solid practice moving forward. But we will also have advanced subspecialty services through clinics that are more based out in the community. And most importantly, getting back to our earlier comment about primary care, we have been and we will continue to push primary care uh, into, the, into the neighborhoods of, of Columbia. Every quadrant of the city will have a good, solid MU healthcare uh, primary care facility, and then there will be uh, primary care facilities in the rural communities surrounding Columbia. Well, like, that, that like I call, Boonville, I, for I example. call the receiving hospital concept. In, indeed, you bet. Yes. And these relationships will extend because, you know, we've talked about the fact that uh, people from Iowa come down here for care, perhaps from uh, from Arkansas. If we had a really good road from Arkansas, they'd probably come in from northern Arkansas rather than go to Little Rock or Springdale or one of those places. Uh, I have a question for you because I've worked with young people. If you were a high school kid, we've got all these programs involved with nursing and all these other specialties. We have Stevens College. I'm probably going to miss a few here. Central Methodist University in Fayette, Columbia College, William Woods State Tech is one that I'm closely involved with right now. High school grads, the real crying need right now is for all of these frontline workers, the nurses, the technicians, the lab people, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds like a good field and a great calling. It is. It's an incredible calling. It's a way to give back to your community. There is nothing better than the feeling of taking care of of a population, taking care of that patient, that moment of truth uh, when the nurse, uh, the tech, the the physician put their hands on a patient and take care of them. So who goes out and talks to the guidance counselors in these these schools (laughs) and talks to the young people, maybe through parent-teacher organizations and and so on and so forth, to try to... uh, Turn things around, the teachers, the people, the front lines, people who work in uh, both the public schools, parochial, these private institutions, et cetera. I mean, that sounds like a huge PR effort. Well, a, a couple of things. Uh, last year, uh, we had a record number of, of people that we actually recruited in. So I think we were well over uh, 3,400 uh, new employees that we recruited in, by far a record. Uh, and you can rest assured our uh, human resources staff and our recruiting staff uh, go out and speak to guidance counselors, uh, go out and speak to administrators, whether it's at Columbia College, uh, State Fair, uh, Central, Me- Central Methodist. We do everything we can to partner uh, with these incredible education institutions uh, We because we desperately need your, your, uh, uh, these employees. Now, if you're a parent... Uh, I, I, I'm going to give. I'm going to give one piece of counseling to the, all the parents out there. Have your son or daughter go into nursing. Mm-hmm. It is uh, uh, one of the best jobs there is out there. You make a, a, a very solid uh, income. Uh, you can go anywhere in the United States and get a job. It, it, and it's an incredibly meaningful job. Okay, Jonathan Curtright. We have another call. Let's come in at seven minutes, six minutes before ten. Good morning. You're on the air on KFRU AM and FM. Good morning. Are there any plans to expand the waiting area in the emergency room and parking? The emergency room, waiting room, desperately needs to be expanded. We know that. Uh, We have changed our model when we brought over the pediatric emergency uh, department from Women's and Children's. We've changed our model and how we uh, bring patients through. Uh, Your point's well taken. Uh, Now, it's Part of the reason why why your point's well taken is if you look at our total emergency medicine volumes of patients on a monthly basis, uh, a year ago we were right at about 4,500 patients per month. Uh, We are now averaging uh, 7,800 to 8,500 patients per month in the emergency department. Not urgent care. Uh, that's, an, that's also uh, up uh, two, two times over its budget, but our emergency medicine is, uh, uh, we, we, we definitely have uh, some patient uh, constraints and, and our volumes are growing like crazy in this area. Uh, we know we need to ensure that we have a good, solid waiting room. But more importantly than that is let's get the patient registered and into the examination room 
ASAP so they don't sit in a waiting room at all. I uh, have to just kind of curious, uncompensated care. I don't know that most people realize how much uh, free medical care as a public hospital that you provide uh, and that you have to overcome that to still come up with your, your profit uh, margins that you have achieved, which are actually very impressive. But how much uncompensated care per uh, year do you actually provide? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. Uh, we're one of two what they call safety net hospitals in the state of Missouri. The other is University Health or Truman Medical Center uh, in Kansas City and then uh, MU Healthcare in the central part of the state. Uh, our total uh, uh Self-pay or total charity care uh, is right around $140 million a year. Uh, and uh, of our total charges, historically, uh, it, we, we, ha- we provide about 4.5% of our total charges that are uh, uh, for uncompensated care or self-pay. And that puts us in the 90, 90 to 95th percentile of all academic medicals in the United States. So, yes, we are doing... Uh, fairly well financially, but we uh, take care of the patients regardless of their, bil- their ability to pay every single day, and that's something that we take very, very seriously. Medicaid uh, expansion will help in that regard, won't it? It, it, it will. It will. But as you know, uh, the number of people that actually are signing up t- uh, for Medicaid expansion uh, has been much less than any of us had anticipated. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, if you are eligible uh, for this and you're listening, uh, please consider doing that. It, it is, uh, if you have access to good, solid insurance, it, your access to your care will be even be better uh, as a society and as a state. You, you know, the historical note is that uh, MU Healthcare was basically sold to the legislature in building this hospital. It was a huge competition with Kansas City, and it did deal with primarily, as I recall when I moved here, with indigent care. And I think initially they did not want patients from Boone County flooding their uh, their hallways, and uh, it's kind of interesting a transition that did occur. <laughs> yeah, that, that that is certainly not the case anymore. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. I, I know that. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, you've got two or three minutes left. Let's talk the, about emergency care a little bit. Every day, um, your ambulances provide services to the citizens of Columbia without a supplemental tax or without utilizing what I'd characterize as local tax dollars. I don't think people in Columbia and Boone County realize that that is a service that is provided by both hospitals, which is a very unusual um, model, if you will. Um, We're model keeps coming out in what we're talking about here. Uh, Talk a little bit more about the ER capabilities because it is MU's hospital by far and away that provides the um, the greatest volume of emergency care in our community with the greatest asset types, for example, aerial uh, helicopters, et cetera. Um, talk a little bit about the volumes on top of what you said about double, but I'm, I'm talking about the hardcore uh, buildings falling, car accidents, uh, heart attacks. We have a minute. We have one minute. All right. Well, a, a couple of things. Every time I, I look up and I see uh, an MU Healthcare helicopter taking off, uh, I literally say a little prayer because that's a, that, that's a, I guarantee they're going to an incredibly, incredibly difficult situation. Or I see one of our uh, rigs going to Interstate 70 where there was the, the horrible tragedy uh, a se- a several or a, about a month ago uh, where one of our first responders uh, here in Boone County was tragically killed. Uh, we have one of the best uh, acute care services uh, as a county, uh, as a region you could possibly have. Uh, and it is one of the I mentioned before one of our strengths is primary care, but the other one that, that is out there is acute care. It is a, uh, uh, our trauma program. We are a level one trauma center, and we take care of this, uh, take care of these incredibly and John, and John, complex and Jonathan, patients I'm sorry. every single day. And Jonathan, Thank you. I'm sorry, I got to cut you yeah. off. I got to join the network. I got to reserve civil time. We will get you back here again, maybe sooner than we thought. Listening to the KFRU Sunday Morning Roundtable podcast. 
Don't forget to check out the show live Sunday mornings from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. on News Talk 98.9 FM and 1400 a.m. KFRU. And check out our other podcast from Columbia Morning with David Lyle, The Morning Meeting with Simon Rose, The Closers with George Young, The KLIK Sunday Morning Roundtable, and more on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. From News Talk 98.9 FM and 1400 a.m. KFRU.